Thank you so much, Dan. And if you haven't been to Roaring Stories, I know there's a few out of Peninsula people here tonight. It's one of Sydney's great independent bookshops. I have to say, I live down the road, so I'm not at all biased. But one of Sydney's great independent bookshops, and I urge you all to go there. Um, up on Darling Street. I know Mike McDonald, you've been there already. Um, <laughs> Mike went there instead of coming here, so I'm just taking this opportunity for a dig. Now, I have long been a fan of Kate's work. Uh, she is a prominent historian of the 18th century in Australia and the 18th century world, not just, but in, an historian in Australia of the 18th century world. And for those of you who've read her previous works, there are themes which uh, unite them and this, and, and it's lovely to see those themes, to, to read across your work, Kate, and see this is the kind of uh, current point at which it's arrived. You know, those books focus on uh, the British Empire and the indigenous societies it encountered in lots of different global contexts. Um, and your prose, Kate, and this is this shines forth in this book, like it is engrossing and it is completely characteristic with Kate's voice. You can hear it coming through on every page. I love, I love the kind of mode, you know, I said this to you recently. You know, well, to be fair, Ben Long did hit his wife on the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shouldn't see him as a wife on the So uh, the to be fair is, um, is, is something that I think I, I should have counted. But there's, a, there's definitely more than 10. But, so, but this, book, this book forced me to look afresh at things that I thought I knew well. And I hope that that's what it does for everybody that reads it. And I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, Dan has given us a little, a brief overview, a brief overview of the book. Um, so I'm just going to launch straight in to questions because it is a, a daring, it is imaginative, uh, and it's a re revelatory book that, that does change the way I think that we understand our nation's origins. And in doing so, it challenges us quite explicitly, I think, to change the way we envisage the present of this nation and also its possible futures. So Kate, can you start by telling us a little bit about what made you want to write this book? You know, in the opening sections you describe the ways that Philip and Benelong have been understood from the 19th century right up until the present. So I, I wondered if you could begin by telling us a little bit more about what dominates existing narratives about the two men and why that annoyed you so much. <coughs> did, yes. Um, yeah, I did want to, well I had been thinking about writing about Ben Long for more than a decade really, um, but I didn't actually think of myself as an Australian historian and he does, he and Philip fit into an Australian historian field which of course really is British Empire field until 1901, which is another little point that I wanted to make, to be fair. Um, <laughs> uh, so he, he had come across, he, Ben Long had come up in my earlier research just as a small bits and pieces. What I did find, uh, and literally just small bits and pieces, but what I found is that over the last decade, I had constantly had journalists come talk to me and ask questions about Benelong, not feeling that I was particularly an expert, which is a big red flag that there's obviously not quite enough ready information to um, non-Indigenous journalists, at least. I also noticed that um, Indigenous um, scholars and friends would start asking me about him. So I just thought, actually, this is a man that does need more a, a, a larger broadcast of his, um, of his life. And then it's quite evident that when you scratch the surface, and it is pretty much just the surface until now, um, that his image has, has m most recently been that of a tragic figure, uh, that he's a victim of colonial manipulations. Earlier there had been kind of worse renditions of him, that he'd been kind of like a, a foolish perhaps a sort of slightly comical person, maybe even a traitor, a sellout to his own people. And often compared poorly to um, a more lauded uh, resistance warrior like Pemelwee. Uh, so that was uh, my kind of incremental research that I did over a decade or so, showed that, this, that both those pictures, being either a kind of a, a hapless joker or a tragic victim, uh, neither of them fit what my research was telling me. Um, I decided not to only <coughs> do a biography of Ben Long, though, for various reasons. Um, but I thought that adding Philip, who in many ways is a sort of spokesman for my earlier <laughs> research into British imperial politics, and Philip is the kind of representative of that, and kind of, I suppose, my earlier research. Um, 
But helpfully, I thought that comparing him constantly to Ben Along, the comparison became fruitful. It became a, 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 an easier shorthand way to kind of pick out uh, themes that, um, that, that we could uh, theme, say, as the gender relations of each man's world or the respective childhoods of each man's world. It becomes easier and quicker and hopefully a bit more um, original or dramatic to be able to see them in comparison. So in the end, I wanted to do them both. When you scratch the surface as well of, of, of Philip's image, um, that's also rather thin until now, to be honest. Um, I think in brief, I think that Australians think of him as a founding father of a settler nation, which is the last thing that Philip would have thought of himself as, because he was a loyal servant of the British Empire, would have been horrified to think of the idea of a nation splitting off from that. Um, and what I and then when I got into the research for Philip, what I found increasingly was that New South Wales probably wasn't even the biggest thing in his own life, even though we think that it must have been because Philip stands for New South Wales in our memories. But the way I tracked him across the British Empire, he was also a good way of illustrating the really the global context of what was going on, such that 1788 is sort of situated as a moment in a big kind of global history. So could, there are some, the, the, the book is extremely beautiful and has these very beautiful end papers. Uh, and after the end papers, we come to some maps of Sydney, what we now know as Sydney Harbour, that appear right at the start of the book. And, and to me, they, they looked both familiar and quite strange. Um, they depict the Eura, uh, the Eura clan sites of the direct speaking peoples in the 18th century. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the social landscapes of the people that Ben Long would have known so well, and, yeah. and these lands that we sort of understand <laughs> in, in our way, but that yeah. looked quite uh, different and very um, connected to him and into, into which these settlers arrived? That's right, yes. Um, I have to say this is the first time I get to speak about this book, or Ben Long at all, I think, in Wongal land, which is Ben Long's land, so that is particularly kind of resonant for me. Um, and uh, it's certainly the case, as it, any, um, any historian of this um, era of in Sydney Harbour would tell you, and certainly my Indigenous friends would tell, tell me, that in the 18th century, of course, what an Indigenous person would only identify themselves in, in terms of the particular land, so a Wongal person, a Wallamadigal person, and so on. Um, as probably many of you, because you're Sydney siders, know, that when the colonists came and said, what's your name, they said Eora, or Yiora. Uh, which is where the people from here. Um, and that has had a mixed history for the last 200 years. Um, I use it in the book um, under advisement. It was, it was a very difficult decision to make actually, but I use it in the book to represent the 15 or so closest clans around the harbour. This is, this is a spelling of uh, what we are used to hearing as Eora, yeah, Eora which yes. is spelt with a Y I U Y U R A. Yes. That's right, but it is, um, as most Sydney official buildings will say, E-O-R-A, as we know of. But um, taking advice from Darug-speaking peoples, uh, we decided to change it to Yiora. My friend Pauline was also telling me that this is also a little bit more gender inclusive to be able to add that particular um, vowel sound at the beginning as well. Um, the people who did tell me, the direct Aboriginal Corporation, told me that this, is, uh, this was a better spelling and they were happy for me to use Yiora, but they personally would have preferred me to use the word Darug, which explains the whole kind of 30 or so clans, the wider, the, the coastal and the hinterland. Um, but that's the name of the language that they used. So again, it's still not quite really what anyone would have said in the 18th century. So immediately, and I kind of try and say this straight up front, immediately we hit some linguistic problems which hopefully is just a taste of the difference, um, the, the newness that we will enter when we kind of really try and get the fine grain of the 18th century world that both these men lived in, rather than assume that there's easy similarities between their world and our world. And it's that fine grain world that, you know, you evoke it so intimately and it, you carry us with you so effectively. And it left me going, how do you know these things? You know, what, what, how are you reading sources to kind of paint these pictures of these two men in such rounded detail, whilst never kind of um, as, assuming or, uh, uh, that you know what they're thinking? Like you, you tread that boundary very carefully and effectively, I think. 
Uh, and, and there's a little clue that I think you leave kind of a third of the way through the book when you say the peculiarities of the colonial archives mean that a non-writing Indigenous person occasionally emerges more clearly than a great white man. What sources led you to be able to paint this picture of these men and how did you read them? Yes. Also, by the way, even though Tamsin's a very good friend of mine, we didn't actually rehearse this before. <laughs> so, so, which I thought would be fresher this way. Fresh. So every time she said, so my next question is, I was like, oh, what do you say? <laughs> I remember this, but I do remember this bit. Um, uh, so, I mean, I'm thrilled that, that you think that there's sort of fine-grained sense of, you know, a personal sense of these two men, because the sources are not on the face of it going to yield that. Um, a lot of them are, as any historian of the 18th century will tell you, um, a lot of them are well gone over. Um, it's not that I was discovering new sources, but I was trying to read some of them in more, uh, in, in slightly fresher ways or different ways, different ways compared to the kind of the motivations that I had for even thinking about these two men in comparison. So that quote, um, occasionally someone like Ben Along appears more clearly from the archive than someone like Philip. That quote came from when I'm talking about the two men in London. They were in London together from 1793 to 95. Uh, Philip took Ben Along back with him when he retired. Um, so Philip never comes back, but Ben Long is there for two years um, before he returns. And um, <coughs> the, the greatest source on, on Ben Long in, um, in England is the Treasury Bill for his expenses, which on the face of it looks like a very boring document. Um, it's just, you know, trousers cost this much, um, bed linen cost this much, um, uh, a servant to take them bathing in the Thames cost this much. Um, so it, it does seem like a dry document, but when you kind of sit with it for a while, it tells you a lot. It told me a lot about, um, when I started adding up, and I did get this from help from a costume historian, when I started adding up the, the cost of what he wore, um, it was extraordinarily expensive. Certainly he was wearing better tailored <coughs> clothes than Philip himself would have been, which is another clue for me thinking, Philip is setting him up for a grand audience, pretty much you know, the only audience that would have accounted for the equivalent of a $3,000 outfit would be the king. So it kind of it prompted me to think about that because I'm constantly trying to think of them in political ways, which I don't think has always been the lens that which people read them as. I particularly like the detail of them swimming in the Thames. I mean, I'm worried for him at the time. Because <laughs> 18th century Thames is not great, um, but he did survive it. Um, but, you know, it, it just gives you senses of that nobody, none of the colonial or English British hosts would have been doing that with Ben Long, they would have been amazed. But it is a kind of, I, I read that as a sign of, um, he's there with a fellow Wongo man called Yamirawani, a sign of their homesickness. <laughs> that this is, this is, you know, you, you would go in the dip in the local waterways um, and, you know, they may not have realised how problematic those waterways had been then, but they, as I said, they survived it. We are among them. Well, no, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the death by Thames. But, I mean, um, um, it, it, case that, you know, even the description of a list of from the Treasury of, of costs doesn't really do justice to the kind of uh, gripping narrative that Kate manages to weave out of those documents and the kind of full picture of, a, of people that she renders with them. So read the book to kind of get what I'm saying. Um, so if, if, um, if, if Ben Long is in this world uh, on the shores of the harbour, um, Philip comes from a very different kind of context. Uh, and you, you talk about the way that his reputation has suffered less than those of other early colonists, notably James Cook. And, and that you say this is because of his, his link to the Enlightenment has been steadier. Yeah. Why does the Enlightenment have such conjuring power, do you think? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. So, um, but he is always paired with that word, oh, he's a man of the Enlightenment. Um, Cook is sometimes called that too, um, but Cook, you know, in a, in a furore like <laughs> the statue controversy that we had in 2019, uh, the, when, there's, when Cook is a symbol of colonial oppression, it's often when he's then divorced, then you, won't, you don't get that word enlightenment anywhere near him. It's when he's divorced from that, from that moment. And then when people defend him, then they attach the word back again. But for Philip, and I use that word steadier, 
Um, partly because he does not seem to be as interesting to Australian history as Cook has been. People haven't kind of stopped in those moments, which are even more plentiful than they are for Cook, of violence and um, certainly unenlightened behaviour. So <clears throat> the more I ploughed into what does it mean um, when people refer to Philip as a man of the Enlightenment, the words that often came up were humanitarian, egalitarian, and occasionally, although less often now, democrat. Um, which are not the synonyms of an 18th century enlightenment. Really, the chief and most important synonym to describe Philip is that he was a rationalist and, and he approached every, everything that he did as a rationalist. And, I, and therefore, I do say, yes, he is a man of the enlightenment, but it's not, it's not those other words, which are really 19th century, I mean, goodness, 20th century kind of words. Um, I know that Philip is, I think there's a Governor Philip Foundation, I mean, there's, there's a few of them, um, and they like to trace a line from the Liberal Party through Menzies to Philip. It's quite explicit. I mean, I, I don't... You're all naughty about main people and you're laughing at that, but that's actually true. You can see the Governor Philip um, Foundation does do it that way. And so I'm interested that liberal is also another word that is then attached to him. And so these are the things that I wanted to critique, but without looking like I'm just bashing a founding father figure, I wanted to say we can learn about what this powerful word the Enlightenment means through this man. So, so understanding the Enlightenment makes us see New South Wales and its founding moment quite differently. Uh, I had a, um, this is down in my list as a bonus question, but I'm just going to like bring it up the order. Because um, it's about Philip. Well, it's not really about Philip, it's about his first wife. You write quite teasingly of Philip's <coughs> unusual first marriage to Charlotte and her close relationship with a Mrs. Anna Maria Kane, who is buried with her and described on the tombstone as her companion. Yes. Now, I love that this idea that Australia might have some founding lesbian stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, <laughs> Philip also seems quite into men. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He certainly seems to spend the majority of his life in the company of men, avoiding, you know, his second wife for much mm. of the first ten years, of, eight years of their marriage. Like, so, like, so, okay, uh, there are some 18th century historians in the room, and you would never use the word lesbian to describe anything that happened in the 18th century, I'm sure. Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but... These are homosocial worlds, yeah. and um, and you contrast that very explicitly with the uh, with Ben Long's universe and, mm. and the, the role that women play in in that world. Yeah. So and so gender actually plays a big explanatory role in this book. And please tell us a bit more both about Charlotte yes. and um, Mariana, but yes. also yeah. Philip and his great uh, men. Yeah. Great. I should also say, like, a couple of years ago when I'm working on this book, Tamsin would sort of disultorily say, how's your book going on our founding lesbians? But, <laughs> and I do wish I could have written that book, maybe one day I will. But in the end, I went down a huge tunnel with my research assistant, Pete, Paige Gleason, who's there with me. Um, we were both very intrigued for weeks. Um, and in the end, it comes down to about a couple of pages in the book, which is sad. But it does seem that uh, Philip's first wife, Charlotte, <coughs> much older than him, it's already something kind of unusual in the 18th century. Um, she brings a lot of money to the marriage. He's like a 20-something naval just about lieutenant, <coughs> no money. Uh, she makes him sign what is in effect the equivalent of a prenup. Um, much, much more astoundingly, she gets, uh, after six years, they separate um, legally, which I didn't even really kind of fully understand it even existed. Um, didn't have a divorce, because that's almost impossible in the 18th century, but um, legally separate, by which time, which means that they can't remarry, but they can be separate, and Charlotte gets all her money back. So I think, well, this is a pretty unusual situation for young Philip to find himself in. Um, but then when I discovered that Anna had lived with them all the way through their, that marriage, had also lived with Charlotte all the way through Charlotte's earlier marriage, dies and they share a grave together and they're called companions. I just thought this is the book that I should have been writing. But, um, anyway, in the book that I did write, um, it's, a, it's just a way for me to get to the point of Philip's um, distinct uncomfortableness with conventional heterosexual patriarchal life, right? Um, and 
I don't push the homosexual world too much that, that he likes the homosexual world. I mean, he is always in the company of men. He's a naval officer, and then he's leading a colony dominated by men. But, um, and he doesn't particularly like his second wife either, so there's all that, yes. But there's no other evidence for anything yeah. else. And he doesn't want, <laughs> he doesn't want Barangaroo to give birth in his house. He doesn't like that. And he feels very discomforted when... Yeah. I think he finds women horrible. horrifying. Um, but that was just an extreme, and, and I think that is clearly an extreme version of what's going on in 18th century British gender relations, but it was just a nice kind of more extreme illustration of how segregated gen, gen, uh, 18th century Britain is in terms of gender relations when you compare it to you're a society of the same era, right? Um, so I think in, because we inherit the kind of Western world from well, in this country anyway, from 18th century Britain, uh, we, we kind of think that that kind of seg gender segregation is probably natural to be what people did in the past, but it's really only what 18th century British people did in the past. Um, and Belong's world really shows a world <coughs> much more integrated gender relations, very, you know, quite obviously different gender roles, um, and it was, I would suggest, um, in most instances, patriarchal worlds, um, but really not patriarchal in the way that Philip's world was. And so in every instance where Benelong is being a negotiator, some kind of political actor, he is always with his wives or his sisters, his daughter, uh, women folk in his world. And that, and that was just by using Philip to make me see that that's actually true for all of the Yora society. So I liked, um, I liked that, that that's another example of how the comparison was made, kind of dramatised that easily for me to be able to make those points and to paint those pictures. Um, I should also say, because a lot of my former colleagues are in the room today, that um, yes, I only write about men generally, which I have been asked with arched eyebrows, why do you always only write about men? But I do like using men to be able to um, go into gender, to, to think about what is the gender kind of state of these men's lives, and so these, these particular men made, made it very easy to do. Now, I want to come to the method of this book, which it's, it's obviously the backwards method is obviously a massively feature, a massive feature of it. And I have to say that if your intention is to unsettle the reader and to make them and to remind us of some of the assumptions that we conventionally bring to, to biography, you, you, you absolutely succeed in doing that. Um, the subtitle, you know, is a history unravelled, and and that is a lovely. It's a really lovely image of of what it is to wind and unwind the threads of a life. Um, but a spooled, you know, or an unspooled thread is still a linear history um, with causes and consequences that flow from from one to the next. Um, what does this way of writing history, the backwards method, allow you to do that would otherwise have been difficult? And how does it help us see the beginnings and ends of that thread in, in different lights? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed writing it in reverse. Um, I did actually all the way through originally say that I'm writing it in a backwards method, but then my, some of my readers alerted me that that has other connotations, the word backwards. So we, we changed it to this is history in reverse. Um, and it's not actually time going backwards as well, it's another thing I wanted to stress, unlike mm -hmm. some novels that I've read, which, which does actually play with that idea, which is extremely unsettling. Um, but they are events plotted in reverse order. Um, and it allowed me to do a, a few things. Um, the number one thing really was that I thought that the reverse ordering was a match to the kind of basic arguments I wanted to make about Philip and Ben Long, that we could should reverse really, upturn at least some of ideas, uh, founding ideas about those men. Um, in a practical sense, it means that the early chapters foreground the later lives, which introduce you to these men in ways that you perhaps didn't expect. So you're introduced to Philip, he's immersed in 1790s Britain after he's been the governor for five years. He spends nearly 10 years helping the British state fight the French Revolution, which should be a clue to the kind of politics he has. Um, and also uh, that, um, you know, if it's almost double the length of time of his governorship, maybe the governorship wasn't the most, the, the pinnacle of his life. Um, and thirdly, it, it, it makes us think, you know, is this about just serving the state or does he have a particular passion for actually what that imperial state now represents, which is an escalating global empire, which sees the French empire as its number one threat. 
So that <coughs> situates Philip straight up that way. Of course, we do then arrive in New South Wales and we spend a lot of time in the book in New South Wales, but I'm hoping that the, the, the alternate kind of beginning has now coloured the way that we're going to read that. Um, and similarly, in those first early chapters, we get Ben along thoroughly, happily, um, comfortably re-immersed in his Yuyora society, which in this case is no longer in the Wongal lands, but in Wallamadigal lands, some kind of ride council area, um, because Wongal lands have been impacted so much by colonists by this stage. Um, which instantly, I hope, over, you know, makes us think again anyway about the idea that this is a man who ended in a tragic way. Um, if we spend all chapters one and two, seeing him um, well-respected, beloved, and immersed, and busy, and um, having his life, but simply away now from the colony. Do you, um, do you see this as a political history? I mean, you mentioned that word earlier, and throughout the book you, you talk about ambassadors and diplomat, diplomacy and tactics. Uh, why, you know, I think you probably do, I mean, you suggested, your use of the word earlier suggests that that is part of your framing, and yeah. why is it important to think about it in that way? Um, I think it is in, to the extent that I do like to frame that their chief, the Philip and Benelong's chief kind of <coughs> activities and the way that they think of themselves when they interact with each other at least, which of course is, does not account for all of their lives, but when they interact with each other, they think of themselves as political actors. But the only reason why they're having a relationship is because they respect each other as political leaders of different communities that have to try and get along at this point. Um, and the reason why I like to emphasise that, which may not seem important one way or another, is that very often the word friendship is used instead to describe um, Philip and Belle Long, which I don't, and I don't think I use that word at all in the whole text. Um, and I don't necessarily need to, I don't want it to make the claim that they're not mates. Um, there's no overt, well, most, for the bulk of it, they don't seem to be disliking each other, of each other. But to say that they're friends instantly starts to defang what they're there for, or why we even want to remember them. It makes Philip inviting Ben along to um, London look like it's just because that's what he would do for his mate. And it looks like Ben along would accept the invitation because he's a curious kind of chap. So it instantly makes, it distracts you from thinking about why is this going on? Why is this relationship even carrying on and why would it even extend all the way over to London? Um, and I do try and speculate, although I do underscore that it's a speculation, but an historian's research speculation, that Philip's whole kind of, um, the, the, the motivation for him to put up with the various humiliations that it entails, uh, trying to, con to trying to entice Ben along to stay with him and stay connected to him, um, is because he is a man of the 18th century who assumes, just like every other uh, British intervention into Indigenous societies, that there will one day have to be a legal settlement, and you need mediators from the Indigenous peoples to do that. And um, it, it should underscore the fact that in 1788, it had never not happened in the British Empire that you would have a legal settlement, and Philip knew that. So he may not have thought that it was going to happen in his governorship, but he knew that he had, it was part of his job to pave the way for that to happen. And for Ben Long to accept the invitation doesn't necessarily mean that he understood what Philip was thinking in terms of a legal settlement, um, but it does underscore the fact that it, for him it was a continuation of his decision for a brief period to engage with the newcomers to try and figure out as much as he could from them, that he thought that negotiation, collaboration, engagement was perhaps the best route to protecting his own society. What becomes very clear when he wants to leave and go and live in Wallamadigal land, there, I don't know where my directions are at this point, this way, um, is changed his political strategy, thinks that this negotiation shtick is not actually working anymore. It's not worth it, particularly when I don't have my mate, my political mate, Philip around anymore. And it's a, an abandonment of that move. Um, but I wanted to try and say that both those decisions, that to be a negotiator or then maybe to say actually the better way to protect is to kind of refuse the, the colony, are both in political decisions, right? Rather than the random kind of actions of a person without politics or that this is a whole society without politics. I wanted to reinvest this, all these clan societies with as much political intrigue and dynamism as we naturally like to award to European societies at the same time. Yeah. Mm.
I mean, and you really, you really succeed in that, I think. Um, and by legal settlement, are you uh, hesitant to word, use the word treaty in this context, or is there...? Well, I just had a, a pushback today from another talk from that, so it's saying, well, you didn't say you wanted to have a treaty, so you couldn't have possibly wanted a treaty, and the word, the word doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a loaded word today. Um, I will just say that the, the counterfactual of a, the settler Australia that emerged out of New South Wales not having a treaty has dominated everything that I, that, that dominated the whole writing of this book. And it, it is the shadow of the whole book, the counterfactual that there was never a legal settlement. And what I just wanted to underscore, at least for this week, <laughs> as we head into the polls, um, that not having a legal settlement is really weird and strange and anomalous, and it's not natural. Um, even when we want to compare us, compare just vaguely our histories to Canada or New Zealand or other later settler repercussions of the British Empire. Um, and if we know that, I think it might change our views about what we're being asked to do on Saturday, um, which is not even close to coming to a legal settlement. <laughs> it's just getting to a point of recognition that we might be able to have a political or a legal discussion about a kind of fairness. Mm. Um, you, you write, and this is my last question before we open up for your questions, um, you write about the tendency in much modern history of Indigenous people to do what Gina Bryan calls firsting and lasting. Much modern history about Indigenous people does that. It, it recounts settler firsts and Indigenous lasts. Your book really sets about doing the opposite, or it's, it sets about doing something that is, is um, um, counterposed to that. It, it's about finding many kinds of ends and many kinds of beginnings, and it's about asking when does a beginning begin and when does an ending end? Uh, and this matters, you argue, because, and I quote here from the kind of final pages of the book, to see that Ben Along remained connected to his Eora society, indeed thrived in it, when away from colonial eyes, is to think again about endpoints. Ben Along's generation was not the last of an unworldly people. What futures does this rethinking of Philip and Ben Along um, open up for us? Um, yes, that is good. As you know, most historians will do at this kind of point to say, so, so I don't talk about the future. Um, <laughs> but you know, we all know that we write histories because we're interested in the present. That's why I write history anyway. Um, and our present kind of <coughs> thinking about what's going to happen next, which hopefully is what Saturday is also about. Um, I did like to underscore, I mean, I was very moved by Jean O'Brien's, she has a book called Firsting and Lasting. In the Australian context, Grace Carskins has talked about that quite eloquently, about how in colonial history we're often looking for beginnings, you know, the first famine, the first crop, the first battle, the first post office, whatever, um, which does just, uh, it just implies, even I'm sure unconsciously it implies that there's ever-growing capaciousness about what firsts will then lead to. It'll lead to seconds. Um, when, and then she also says, but in Aboriginal history, the search is so often for endings. The last Indigenous speaker, the last chief, the last ceremony and, and whatnot. Um, which may be um, well-intentioned for historians to go search for those endings, but it can't help but also naturalise the idea that there is no seconds, there is no future. Right? So by trying to muddle that, and of course that does play as well into just my general kind of scrambling of time. It's not a scramble of time, it's just reverse, but it seems like maybe sometimes it's a scramble of time. Um, by playing with time, I hope that I wanted to, uh, I hope that some readers will see that those, those search for beginnings and search for endings is not as productive as perhaps we thought they might be. That to think maybe that Philip is the end of an 18th century version of empire, um, because he didn't succeed in making the legal agreement that was for him would have been natural, um, that a, a different kind of um, different kind of empire is then going to emerge out of that, um, and that Ben Along um, is of course not the last of his people either. He's the first of an endless train of people who negotiate with British colonists, and even in his own life, he's not even the first of that because I wanted to kind of show that. These are people who had long um, had a long history of dealing with strangers and um, insiders. That's why we have welcomes to country, because the convention is ancient. 
of meeting and negotiating and figuring out what is needed in an encounter and whether people can survive it. So, um, so yeah. So the first thing and last thing was just it, it's it was it's just a it, that was actually one of my original provocations many many years ago when I read both O'Brien and Kaskins, um, and then I think that was probably the first prompt to think maybe if I really tried to change our normal way of thinking about time in this book, um, but only to a disrupting extent, not to a distracting extent, um, that it might be appropriate for that story. Yeah. So, enough from me for a minute. Do, do they, are there questions uh, from you? Hi, hello. Um, this week is the fifth anniversary of the New South Wales government spending three million bucks to buy the grand side of Benelong on the corner of Watson Street and Auden Avenue in Putney. Um, since then, the, the property has been uh, leased out to residential tenants and hopes that the uh, Gable Elders, Uncle Chica, Uncle Ray, Uncle Alan, and others had for a museum and keeping place have, have been shelved. Uh, do you think there's value in a, in a museum uh, environment uh, to be able to um, you know, take school excursion groups or to, in, in other ways, keep, you know, foster these sorts of conversations that we're having tonight? And if so, what sort of format would you like to see? Uh, that sort of museum, what sort of shape would you like me to take? I can repeat that if you would like. Yes, yes. I can do that, yeah. Because this is Adam Joseph, who was a driving force behind the state government buying that um, property, bless his heart. He's been absolutely tireless. He also brought us this beautiful picture behind you as well, which he, uh, which he owned. So that's, that's the better version of something that is partly on my cover. So thank you, Adam. Um, Restate the question. The question was, uh, in 2018, uh, the New South Wales government uh, purchased the plot of land, which is a suburban house plan um, house in Putney, because a committee had kind of figured out that's where Ben along, and his last wife, and his one of his earlier protégés, Nanbury, um, are buried. Um, and I would like to see that being a keeping place. I think that would be. Um, a really, a really good idea. I, I think that you know, a, a, you know, a, a kind of museum, which therefore would require kind of a tourist trade. I understand the logistics of getting tourists to Putney. May not. I mean, it was already kind of an epic adventure for me to get to Putney, and I worked at Macquarie University for a while. But, um, that, that's unfair to Putney, but um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So the logistics might be a problem for that, and maybe we need if we if if. If we can agree that remembering Ben Along and his community uh, more powerfully in this town, it might be better served in the more popular tourist places, but that's just a practical issue. In theory, yes, I would love to see um, a memorial, maybe not just to Ben Along, but to his society of that moment. And think of that whole society as a dynamic, complex, um, riven, uh, so a, a dynamic society that tried to cope in various different ways uh, with the impact of, um, of the First Fleet arriving and then the Second Fleet and, um, and surviving it. Um, and so it would be, it, 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 it is a nice reminder and I'm glad it still is there even though we, we know that it's not quite come to the next stage of its life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting Enlightenment type people in this period is the way in which they try and find comparisons and they make comparisons between their societies and the societies that they're encountering. But as you pointed out, that's a really dangerous thing to do. It's really tricky to make straightforward connections between how things were in the past and how things are in the present, just as it's hard to make really straightforward equivalences between how things are for one culture and how things are for a different culture. How did you negotiate that and avoid kind of falling into the same traps? I'm thinking particularly about the ways in which, you know, Philip's looking for, as you say, a, a kind of potential legal interlocutor, and he's going to kind of nominate someone as the leader, as a, as a kind of patriarchal representative of the people. Um, and how justified was he in doing that when if what you've actually understood about the way culture at the time. Like, how do, we, how do we make sure that we don't say 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking of those like chest plates with king pillars mm. and stuff like yep, that. Yep. Mm. Yeah, no, you're quite right. So, <laughs> you say the question. Oh, sorry. You do. I can. You do. There was a question about Enlightenment, uh, European Enlightenment uh, societies, in connection to compare um, and the difficulties and um, tensions and problems uh, in doing so as a, as a scholar and not to take those on face value. That's right, and also that Philip would have, you know, in an ideal situation, and the various incarnations of Philip back in the South Pacific and North America before him. Um, when they want to make legal settlements, they want to find their equivalent. And most of the time, they can't find them, obviously, because um, Britain is kind of uniquely, extremely hierarchical in the way that you often don't find in other societies in the 18th century, at least among the non-Western societies. Um, so it's always a problem, and so most of the time, they end up just inventing someone, or you can be the king or whatever. And you can have a breastplate sometimes to make, make, make this the case. Um, so, how do I deal with it in the book? Yeah, it is, that, that, that's a very astute question. It, is, it was kind of tricky. So what I wanted to kind of say that Ben Along was on the lookout for, uh, interested um, as a communal leader for at least the coastal Yora clans, which is about 15 of them, not always friendly clans, but do share a language, do share um, a sense of kind of certain rit cultural rituals, um, even if sometimes those cultural rituals look like animosity, like, and even if you're going to enact a ritualized battle, the enactment of it is turns out to be a cultural binder. So, um, but I, I did want to kind of stress that 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 is the kind of communal mind that Ben Long had, but he would have had absolutely no understanding, or would have been completely horrified of the idea of a single king being at the top of a triangle kind of pyramid um, around Sydney Harbour, and hopefully that comes through sufficiently. One thing I will say that I did um, kind of sprinkle through the book, which was an idea given to me by Bill Gamage, which I originally didn't think was true, but then it kind of stuck with me, that Gamage had speculated that Ben Long may have been a healer, a Garagian. Um, and, there's a, and the more I started looking, there are, say, a handful of sources that might suggest that's true. And if he was, it means, it explains a little bit why you find Ben Long in so many other people's countries so readily, when really some protocols would have put question marks about that. Um, and partly why, you know, I mean, for instance, in the, in the first chapter you see, I give evidence that when he dies, there's a humongous, uh, I don't think that's a word, uh, a giant um, tribute battle waged in, uh, in his honour after his death. We know that more normally those tribute battles uh, in the 18th century involve about two dozen warriors. The one that was waged for in honour of Ben Long involved 200 warriors. This is a sort of a, a semblance of a multi-clan respect for the man. Yeah. Um. Um, this is a sort of a logistical question. I hope it's not too tricky to answer. Um, I really loved your book, but, and but as I was reading it, you know, the, the will, the force of like going forwards in narrative, the drive of beginning, middle, and end. I kind of had to check myself to go backwards. How did you logistically, like, actually work out how to tell the story in reverse? Do you want to rephrase that? How on earth did you tell the story in reverse? <laughs> <laughs> So that was the question. Um, so that is a great question because um, I, I did actually, when I said this to various of my historian friends, they're well, <laughs> horrified. Um, I have to say that the first person I talked to was Tim Rouse, who is a quite eminent historian, but quite famously a little bit um, straightforward speaking, um, plain speaking. Um, so I thought, well, if, if he doesn't like it, he's just going to tell me straight. And he said, um, oh, that sounds intriguing. You should start reading some of those novels. I've got quite a few novels that do it this way. I couldn't find too many history books that do it this way. And particularly Martin Aris, a Amos's Time's Arrow. Does anyone know that book? I am a big fan of Martin Amos, but I hadn't read that book. And I did read it, and it starts with a guy in the bathroom, and his lunch has just gone up through him, coming out the out of his mouth. And I just thought, this is horrifying. I am not <laughs> going to I am not going to write a history book like this. But that is actually time moving in reverse, which I didn't knew I was not going to do. I just wanted to plot the event uh, the events that were key 
um, in reverse order. So I did kind of want to stress that. Of course, as soon as you do do that, then there are going to be middle micro scenes that are then plotted in forwards running way. At first, I wasn't worried about that. I thought it'll just come naturally. And I actually did really enjoy writing the first draft, which I wrote pretty quickly. Um, and because you know writing is obviously slower than we think or read, um, it slowed down enough to think that this was not too problematic when you're actually writing. So I, I knew the kind of the, the double stories. I knew how I was going to interweave them, and so I could just. So I wrote it from chapter one to seven uh, when all the events are plotted in reverse. But it was a much longer editing time than I um, anticipated, because the first thing that my editor said was, "Well, you actually do make these random decisions to move some scenes forward." Uh, so you have to be more conscious of when you are making those little decisions. And so what is the scale that is appropriate to go forwards when we then start the next event, which happened before that scene? Um, which I thought, I didn't think, I just thought it seemed like, and the, all the decisions were natural to me, so it would obviously be natural to the reader. So the editing process took a long time because we did have to think about what was, what, what did, what, 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 what would seem more natural for the reader to kind of, say I was describing a corroboree scene um, which uh, Ben Long had been involved in. Uh, that there was about two or three pieces of evidence from the colonial officials who saw this scene. So I had enough evidence to kind of write this kind of reasonably rich detail and so I wrote it forwards, right? So that's, a, that's one decision because the colonists are telling me how it's happening over a period of about two or three days and I write that scene forwards. But then the next scene is what happened, you know, before it. So, um, so those kind of little micro decisions took a long time. So I would say the editing process took as long as it took to write this. So, um, which I wasn't quite prepared for. But the first, the, 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 the short answer is that it was really easy to write and fun. <laughs> and as a fun challenge, um, I do like having a different, slightly different literary challenge each time I write something. Um, but yeah, the editing process was, 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 was long. I have to say also, there's another someone else in the room called Mike who read that first draft and said, why am I reading this in reverse? You have to explain. You have to. You have to explain the payoff to the reader more about why mm. they need to be disrupted, and not, and, and 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 watch out for those times when it's actually distracting. I did not want it ever to get to that point, and I have already accepted that some readers are probably going to find it, that it maybe did go over the line sometimes, but perhaps enough readers think that it's going to be fruitful. But I don't think it's either or of those things. I think as a reader, you're unsettled by the time. And there's another way that works too, which is that in order to explain what happens after, you need to give the reader some information about what's happened before. So you bring something that is yet to come forward. And then, the, so that helps as a reader. But then when as a reader, you get to that earlier instance, you go, oh, Kate says, as I've already explained. <laughs> but, but the effect is to be unsettled, mm. but because you keep us so engaged by the story, mm. you're never distracted or lost. Mm. And I think it's that productive tension between mm. um, discomfort, mm. but also being quite gripped by a story and by your telling of it, that is the secret source in this book. So. Uh, don't apologise for that. That helps. That, that, yeah. That's why we're here. <laughs> Could I just quickly just j jump in there? That Of course, we, w when we think about forwards writing narrative, which is, I have to say, all my other work is forwards writing, um, we constantly refer to the future anyway, in the same way that I was then had to refer to what would come afterwards. So, you know, if this is a story about Horatio Nel Nelson, and the first chapter is about his childhood and there he is fascinated by water and boats or whatever, we say, <laughs> and soon enough this will all come to fruition and you will see that this is all very relevant. But like there's constantly, we always pepper those, those things in the same way that I just tried to pepper the explanations backwards. So yeah, I tried to kind of remind readers along the way that a lot of the conventions that I was just slightly tinkering with were conventions that we know really well and just for maybe underscoring them a bit more. Yeah. Well, on that note, we will uh, join our hands to congratulate Kate on a brilliant book. <laughs>